here for the first time. Okay. Thank you guys for coming. Uh, for those of you guys who do not know, uh, Phoebe, or Core Investors by Investors, was actually started by a couple of full-time investors uh, because they were tired of getting the sales pitch every single time, going to networking clubs and you know real estate investment clubs and getting the boot camp and the book and page set and things like that. So they wanted to have a place where people could go network, develop the resources they need in this business, which we really can't do this without each other. Everyone has resources that other people don't have. And, um, and a place to be able to learn about real estate without the sales pitch, without the boot camps and the book and tape sets and you know all those upsells. So at any of our PB clubs, you won't get any kind of sales pitch involved. Uh, and uh, if you, you ever find that happening, then definitely let us know. Uh, we have uh, a number of clubs throughout Southern California. If you go to meetup.com and type in FIBI, change the search criteria to unlimited, then you'll find our different chapters. Uh, or you can go to foreinvestorsbyinvestors.com and check those out as well. So um, uh, that being said, uh, each group is a little bit different. Uh, I run the Manhattan Beach group, uh, which next month we're going to be doing it on um, uh, are your rehabs causing you rehab? <laughs> and, uh, and this one is obviously on economics and economic update. And we do, in the Manhattan Beach one, we do more of a panel type discussion. Here we do more of like a round table type discussion where we bring in some experts, but have more of a conversation. So feel free to ask your questions and things like that. And uh, I actually brought some questions as well here to keep the conversation moving. I have a very awesome loaded question for the panelists uh, shortly, which is, which is, when, what is the exact date of the market crash? And if you're wrong, then you're we legally liable. So. <laughs> okay, okay. If you're wrong on this, you're legally liable for this. Oh, no. So, no. <laughs> so <laughs> someone's, someone's going to come back and say, they said it was going to be the end of 2017, and I lost money by investing or something. So, but... <laughs> So, uh, and the way we pay for the club uh, here is, obviously we don't make any money off of the club. It all goes back into it. We have different sponsorship opportunities. If anybody's interested, they can email us. Um, there's actually, um, what happens is we bring different sponsors in. Uh, they pay an annual fee for different uh, vendor relationships with us that I use personally uh, for, uh, for investing purposes. Uh, and so uh, we are constantly you know, finding different resources for our investors to invest with and trying to bring those quality people to the table uh, to invest with us. So that being said, I'm going to go through a couple of those sponsors just so you guys see them. I can figure out this. I'm just going to go through this way. So first one. Well, first thing is we have an annual membership as well where um, an all-chapter season pass for all the different chapters are $2.99 for the year. The single chapter is $1.99. Uh, and you can go to our website and look that up. Um, we have some upcoming events, like I mentioned. These are all in the Phoebe brand, where we don't sell anything at these at our, at our uh, events. Um, are your rehabs causing rehab on August 9th? August 16th, I'm doing a webinar on building your real estate A team. Uh, and then we're having a brunch and learn on how to flip a house A to Z. And then uh, in the next Phoebe Long Beach, we're going to do it on flipping houses. So usually the flipping houses one is uh, we have a, quite a bit of people coming because everybody wants to be flippers. We'll see about now since there's literally no margins in California at all. So we do not flippers anymore right now. Usually when the market tanks, that's the big one we have. You know, so either that or nobody's here because they're all afraid they all lost all their money. So um, let's see here. Our sponsors. I'll go through each one here. I don't need to go through mine. So we have Trillion Capital, which is a uh, private money lender. They they lend on flips consistently in Southern California. We have um, Hart King, which Bill Hart is back here. Raise your hand, Bill. He is uh, my attorney. Helps quite a bit with you know uh, real estate law, contracts, syndications, all of the above when it comes to real estate. We have uh, New Western Acquisitions, which is a wholesaler here in California. I get probably you know two, three deals um, at least on a weekly basis from them, uh, where they show uh, they they basically have um, I'm standing in front of the whole thing while I talk. Sorry. So uh, they 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 get pretty decent deals. I'm seeing some spreads on those deals. Um, uh, it, it's hard right now because you see uh, the margin being thin, but if you have your own capital or your own realtor or something like that, these are the guys that are beating you guys out on, out on price, you know, in those situations. So bringing resources to the table really helps. Uh, Udirect IRA uh, services. Flip, flip
flip houses, you can buy and hold, uh, you can go through and do private lending, you can do a ton of stuff inside your own self-directed IRA. There's some taxes and rules associated with it but that you have to be careful of. So before you just do that, definitely get the right advice. And then we have, this is uh, in a day development. Uh, Tiffany actually helps me run this group. Uh, and uh, she's been on a hiatus for a little while, uh, but she's coming back in September. And she, uh, her, her husband and her uh, run uh, Entity Development, which uh, I have this 10 VII financial calculator, which is, see the panelist economics people here? They, they love this software, it's amazing. It's like six bucks for, for the, for the um, calculator. You can do printouts of your amortization schedules and things like that, it's pretty amazing. I use it every single day. Um, this is LQ Financial Services, a bookkeeping company. This is my wife, so she's the best bookkeeper on the planet. And so, she hates it that I have her slide up here. I'm like, come on, babe, I'm going to get you some more clients. So, <laughs> so uh, community buying groups. Uh, if you go to cbgperks.com forward slash OCG226, uh, that's our affiliate link. Uh, basically, you can get discounts for all kinds of different things. Uh, I, for example, I was building my own house here, and I use Sherwin Williams discount, where you get basically 40% off discounts at Sherwin Williams. So it's like things like that that you can you can utilize. There's tons of different um, you know relationships they have. Build a sign, Dell, Hertz, you know, Red Fax, um, <laughs> 1-800.junk. I mean, there's a ton of these different things. UPS, Sherwin Williams, Office Depot. You know, they basically are a conglomerate that gets a lot of people together in a group to be able to offer discounts to different people. So I don't make any money off of it. It's just something for the, that people can utilize. So, um, and that's pretty much it. So I'm going to, whenever you're ready, Kathleen, your slides are right here on the screen, okay? So you're just up here. So Kathleen has a few slides because we, we love charts. I can't. You know? <laughs> it's like a security blanket. And I'm sorry, Christina just did her economic update at the FIDI events uh, in Pasadena uh, last, or, was it yesterday or two days ago? No, it was a week ago. A week ago, okay. And, that was um, 60 slides and that was a little bit much, I think. Yeah, maybe a little bit, yeah. So and that's why I wanted to have more of a discussion. She's the same problem, like 40 slides and now like 10. You know, yeah, yeah. How, do you, how do you bring out the key ones when all the other ones are so much more important too, right? So. Well, so normally what we do is we go around the room and kind of give a brief introduction, but we kind of have a little bit too many people to do that right now. It'll take probably a half an hour to do it. And so we're going to skip that. Um, and the reason I do that is because I want people to kind of meet the people that they want to have relationships with in the room, that they want to get to know better afterwards. So stick around afterwards and network with as many people as you can, um, because that is really where you develop those relationships with the people that are long term. Um, you know, usually it takes you meeting them over and over again you know, five, six times before they really get to know you and feel more comfortable with you to start doing business with you. Uh, I can tell you, just by running these groups, it's been the biggest asset for my company, just meeting new people, not necessarily just because, you know, there's capital sources and there's, there's um, you know, property sources and different resources in the room for vendors that I need and things like that, but there's also a totally different aspect that most people don't realize is there's everybody here makes money in a completely different way. So, and it's really interesting to be able to go into a room and find out all these different ways people are making money. It, you come up with tons of ideas. I mean, let's face it, we're not just real estate investors here, we're entrepreneurs. That's the whole point. Is everybody wants to be active and make money and do things outside of just working for their job for, for an investment purpose. And so always keep your eyes open you know, for different opportunities. I just had something come to me the other day just from a relationship where I have somebody that buys used, um, uh, used appliances in bulk and resells them and the profits are absolutely ridiculous. I'm going, it's like a 30, 40% return on my capital for my portion of it in like six weeks. So, I mean, these are the types of things it's like, hey, okay, I'll try something like this and test it and see how it works. And, you know, I understand the collateral aspect of it, but there's tons of these different opportunities as it relates to real estate as well that I think is really important. Uh, I'm a full-time investor myself. Um, I basically flip 10 houses a month out of Memphis, Tennessee. We do a lot of value-add multifamily properties. We've flipped a little bit over 600 houses now in the last 10 years, a little bit over 10 years now. So I quit my CPA firm job right before the crash. So I was really smart by doing that. You know, I learned really fun lessons. And I would do it all over again because I gotta stay positive <laughs> about it. But, you know, so I have the right mindset, right? 
So um, that being said, uh, let's get into it a little bit. Um, I would love, um, Kathleen, I'm going to start with you. Um, would you please give us a little bit about your background, what you do, why you love economics, and what you do in Okay, so. just put my first slide up. So, okay, okay so um, I've been in the real estate industry for 23 years now. Um, as a mortgage broker, I am a real estate broker, and right now I use my license um, to help people that want to sell or buy apartment buildings, mostly selling apartment buildings, um, and take that money and put it into something that is yielding them a higher rate of return. So California real estate, like Orange County, Long Beach, LA real estate, right now you can sell an apartment building at a 4% rate of return, or cap rate. And then you can take that money and invest it in something that Matt's doing or in another market in the country. And, you know, even on a triple net lease, you can get six and a half to seven percent. So, you know, that kind of bump in your income is, is pretty good. So that's what I'm doing, like, as a business right now. That's my business part. My husband and I have been married for 20 years this August, and we have an eight-year-old daughter. We, um, we have owned single families, multi-families land. Um, we owned an office building for our business at one point before the crash. Um, we sold it right before the crash, made a million dollars in profit, turned around and exchanged that into a multi, um, it was a mixed use project in Scottsdale, Arizona. It was at 44th and Camelback. It was the premier location, hotel, retail, uh, apartments, you know, um, or condos basically. And the market crashed. It was approved. We had the TTM. It was ready to break ground. The construction loan was set. And the bank went out of business. So um, very interesting lesson that I learned there because, you know, we had not only our own million from the building, but we made profit from the building in this deal. And um, the operator who was running the project had a stellar reputation, not a spec on it. Um, all the due diligence in the world never would have revealed the issue that happened to us. Um, there's no way you could have foretold that um, our project was still vi viable in 2010, even that late, okay? But what happened is then the bank got taken over by the FDIC, and anything that, because they had bad condo projects in Florida, okay? So um, there's no amount of due diligence that could have prevented what happened to us. And so um, learned very valuable lesson. And this is where my passion for economics and doing these types of presentations comes from, because there's no way that's going to happen to me again. And so you know, when you learn a hard lesson in real estate or anything in life, it because it, it it's um, what you do with it. I think you know that really um, tells the story. So. Um, we have sold all of our California real estate. Uh, we are primarily investing right now in distress notes, waiting for the next readjustment. Don't know when it's going to happen exactly, but we'll talk more about that. But that's a little bit of my background. I do have a bachelor's degree in economics from UC Santa Barbara and a minor in keg capping. <laughs> so I'm good to have around at parties. <laughs> I was going to say right after I heard the second half, of, right before I heard the second half of that, that story, I was like, well, this is why you love real estate. So it's not the market of knowing dollars like how you love relationship. Yes. Well, it wasn't our only stuff, investment, you know? luckily. Yes. Right, and right. so, um, you know, uh, my husband and I are financially free. I would say that we're financially free. We make our own schedule. We do what we want to do, when we want to do it. And I love that about real estate. It's really, I think, one of the last things you can really do. So if anybody's new, don't get scared. It's really an amazing thing if you put your mind to it and you know invest in yourself. That's great, Christina. Uh, ditto. Big hit in 2008. I think yeah, everybody else yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, so. um, I started in um, I had my first investment in 1986. Uh, my mom was.
tried to sell that, so I bought it from him at his full price. And then I helped him. And I went moving on to the another time in the area, and then I was in the family, and those things were going high enough to their value that I moved into multiple units in the Southern California area, and then I moved into multiple units outside of Southern California, Arlington, Texas, Mexico, Tennessee, Virginia. Um, I've owned land in Hawaii. And every you hear me, right? Okay. Do you need this? You don't have to, I just yeah. Yes? Okay, I heard it, yeah. So that means somebody needs it. Okay. Um, so I owned in in a variety of places. Right? So I bought my name in Hawaii, Condo Towns. Anybody ever heard of Condo Town? Yeah, I've seen Condo Town. Um, single family, vacation rentals, land, um, duplexes. Fourplexes, multi-units, a condo conversion, which made my big story. Another condo conversion was very successful. I earned four hundred thousand dollars on that one. Um, so in two thousand and six, I got married. Woo! Top of the market. <laughs> I am um, <laughs> married a man who's old, and I'm thankful he's met my husband. Then it's pretty obvious. And what's all? I'll be very, very frank with you. He is twenty-seven years old, and I am. So people do sometimes say, that's, that's your dad? I'm like, no, he's not my dad. He actually is my husband. I know that he choose that. Uh, and he's wonderful. And I'm very grateful and happy to have such a mature, wonderful, loving man who wants to provide for me. But I am the primary financial provider for the family. He lives on a fixed income. He was an engineer with Lockheed and General Dynamics for 25 years. And he was a professor. So, 2006, we get married. We're trying to get pregnant in 2007. My stress is just a little intense at that moment. Uh, we're having some fights, not great surprise. And um, I basically sold everything. I sold all, all the apartment buildings, the condo conversion project I was in the middle of, the fourplexes, everything, cash flow, not cash flow, and working, not working. I sold everything. And I brought all the money home. And uh, I definitely lost a lot of money on that one. Um, I didn't want to wait. I wanted to get pregnant. I wanted to live the dream I had been doing the investing for for so long. Because at that point, I'd been investing for over 20 plus years. And uh, so I sold everything and I went into hard money lending. <laughs> it's much easier. The notes world is so much easier, right? <laughs> if you know what you're doing. It's a good time if you know it. It's true. It is much easier if you know what you're doing. I do know. Since I had done some flipping in 2000 and uh, you know, two, three, four, like that was when anybody could be successful in flipping. And I was one of those people, you know, who was being successful, thinking I knew what I was doing. Um, so I turned everything into notes, and I've been doing that for the last eight years. Um, I, yeah, my husband and I have financial retreat. I drop off my daughter at school every morning. I pick her up at school every afternoon. That was the life I wanted to have. Look on wood, I got one, I wasn't able to produce more than that. My doctor said, hey, look, your body's done. Christine, you're 41. You did good, okay? <laughs> call it good. Um, but it did. When you, I've seen two downturns. You know, I literally, I visit my students, I tell these numbers not to be important, but to understand the impact. I literally have lost a million dollars the same year I gained a million dollars in my investment career. I literally will take a million dollars hit on this one and gain a million dollars over here. And then, you know, the, in the downturn, you know, I just brought everything home because I was losing money on hundreds of thousands. So when you have that kind of money at play and you're not watching the economy, then you really, like, it comes home. Like uh, somebody said to me, said, you finally lost enough zeros. <laughs> right? This is my second downturn, and I finally lost enough zeros. So you become very, very passionate because there are, you know, I, in my world, assets have a job. They're either a cash flow horse or they're an appreciation horse. And the only way you can win in the appreciation horse game is to know what the market's doing. Period. It's just that simple. So, um, so therefore, I'm passionate about it. Unless you're lucky. You have a lot of people in California that were geniuses, right? For the longest time, but they just went up in value. Oh, yeah. Yes, I'm familiar with that story. I did. I did. I did. But I, I, you know, I'm, I'm cautious.
cautious, but I also feel like, um, I'll be very personal, I'm a better person. I'm a better wife, I'm a better mom, I'm a better investor, I'm more knowledgeable, I'm more dedicated, I'm more disciplined, and more diligent. And but it's not a great lesson. It's, it's interesting, because through those financial hardships, you, you become stronger, you know, you really do. And it's, it's amazing when you go through that fluctuation, during the downturns and the struggles is really where you find out where you're made, what you're made of. And you pick yourself up and dust, you dust yourself off. No, don't get me wrong, the whole conversation today is going to be geared around the e e economy and how do we avoid that pain, of course, you know, as much as we can. But at the same time, that downturn and that hit that you take really shows you what you're made of. You can get up and keep moving forward. And so I think, you know, understanding that piece first, no matter what happens in the market, if you have the right mindset, you can get out of it. Because, you know, you talk about fighting with your, with your husband during the downturn and stuff. You should have seen me and my brother. We're business partners. We're, you know, let's go at it. Butt heads, you know, consistently. Especially when there's economic, you know, problems and, you know, things that happen. We took a giant hit, you know. We, we cut costs and, you know, every, did everything we possibly could. Now we're going, you know, gangbusters, but we have that stability factor in place now with our management income, with, you know, our cash flow and things like that. And it's interesting when uh, when you can kind of change your structure because of that economic challenge. And I was actually lucky that it happened right after I quit my job at my CPA firm because I learned that lesson really fast before I had much. You know, my entire ego was based on my credit and all that stuff which when you get punched in the face really hard, your ego goes down really fast, you know? I was the same thing with the, I'm no, you know, I'm so great, and then no, I wasn't that great. <laughs> it was just the market, you know, so, um, but I think that's really important. And so let's talk a little bit about, you know, how to actually find this data and how to pay attention to the market so that we know what we're looking for and what things to keep an eye out for. Um, Kathleen, can you talk a little bit about some of the data sources you go to and what you read, and everybody should be taking notes right now if they're not on specific sites and Absolutely. stuff like that. Absolutely. So. so the third slide, I made a list. I made a list um, because I read a lot. So I have a Well, we're I mean, you know, recession babies, <laughs> right? <laughs> it actually saved my life. My sanity. So, um, so about three years ago, I was introduced to a website called RealVisionTV.com. If you give yourself one gift, um, subscribe to this, or at least go and take a seven-day free trial and then binge watch. Okay, these are five to one-hour interviews with top hedge fund managers top economists, all various types of opinions, not just one doom and gloom, not just, you know, but Jim Grant from Interest Rate, uh, Grant's Interest Rate Observer, um, David Rosenberg, uh, um, you name it, John Mulvin, it, you know, all of these, ben Hunt, all these top thinkers and people that manage billions of dollars. And um, they call it TED Talk for investors. They have them on YouTube too. They're definitely, I mean, they There's have a lot of them on YouTube. Yeah. Um, I actually subscribe. I was a founding member of this group. They recently launched a second service called Real Vision Publications, which, you know, if you read some of those publications, you'll recognize my slides if you come to my presentations <laughs> a lot because this is what I'm reading. And um, it's people that are managing a lot of money, and it's how are they thinking without all of the um, burden of the advertisers. Like, if you're just watching CNBC, stop, stop, because it's just one version based on what the advertisers want you to hear. So, um, so if you want to read, if you just want to um, listen to interviews and understand and think about things, there's a whole series on Bitcoin and um, cryptocurrencies. There's a whole series on macro um, economics and the major themes that are going on in the world right now. Um, so really, I can't say enough about that. I have no financial interest in this service, by the way. I just, you know, it's amazing. Um, the BIS, the B, who is the BIS? Anybody know who the BIS is? Okay, the Bureau of International Settlements. This is the Federal Reserve for all of the central banks. So this is like the central bank for all of the central banks. And um, yes, it's a European institution, and they have um, a 
team of PhD economic people, and um, they put out reports. <coughs> so if you're of a little bit more of the academic economic mindset, and you don't mind reading through some jargon, you should Google for the BIS and look for their most recent report. The title of their most recent 2016 report was called When the Future Becomes Today, which even if you just think about that title for a minute, um, they're really talking about the dangers of the global debt crisis and cycle that we're in um, with the global economy. So Ben Hunt is another of my favorites. Grant Williams is such a joy to read. He writes a newsletter called Things That Make You Go. <laughs> and he is, he's a Brit, and he is hilarious. I mean, you know, Monty Python kind of humor. Uh, John Malvin um, has a free website, malvineconomics.com, and he writes a free newsletter called Thoughts from the Frontline, and that will lead you to a lot of other newsletters and people that are talking about things. Jim Grant, Grant's Interest Rate Observer, um, which is a subscription, um, but you can find his stuff for free if you just surf long enough. And then my newest favorite is this really amazing woman named Daniel Martina Booth, and she wrote a book called Fed Up. She worked for Richard Fisher, who recently retired from the Dallas Fed. So he was on the Federal Reserve Board. She was his right-hand person. And um, she writes a newsletter, a blog, that is fantastic. And she, from an insider's perspective, and she wrote this book called Set Up, which is really um, an amazing read. It's not hard to get through. She's, um, she's got a journalistic background along with an economics background, so she makes an interesting so those are just a selection, and then there's all the free stuff, like the Bureau of Economic Analysis and the Federal Reserve Board statistics. And, you know, you can go and just get all that stuff. It's just, you know, that's easy to find. So the BIS is the top monster. The BIS would be the hardest thing to read. Yeah. Like, that would be, okay. you know, the most academic. But it's not impossible, and you can just look at the charts and you read the summary and the conclusions and stuff, and, you know, you kind of get the idea of how were all these people tracking 2008? Did they make predictions on 2008 or did they more than Well, on Real, Real Vision is more of a collection of different interviews, but they right. have a really great interview with Kyle Bass, who was one of the people that made the most money in the big short. Mm -hmm. And then also Mark Hunt, who was also one of the big people that made a lot of money in the crash, like shorting the mortgage tax securities. Um, Jim Grant, I don't know how like their individual portfolios did, but Jim Grant is has been watching and tracking interest rates for I don't know the guy's got to be seventy or something like that. So you know, um, so I do like to read people that were right in two thousand and eight and people that were wrong in two thousand and eight because I like to get a full range of perspectives and then make up my own mind, which is what I would recommend to every investor. Don't take my word for it. Go research it. And see what makes sense to you. I think it's important, definitely, to you know realize too that this just because they were wrong in the last crash doesn't necessarily mean they'll be wrong here. But at the same time, like I think there's a lot of unknowns to this market in particular, compared to 2008, where um, you know even though we have better lending guidelines right now and people are qualifying to get loans, which that was kind of more of a problem then, is the mortgage backed securities. Now we have a lot of other issues facing. Uh, our, our economy. It could be, you know, a, a European country that goes down, that um, or that goes bankrupt, or something like that, that could cause an issue. It could be China. It could be war. It could be anything. That, there's so many different variables right now that, and it makes it look like right now, if you look at the actual what's really happening in the economy, they really just kick the can down the road, and we're in a worse situation than we were in 2008. Maybe not on the lending piece specifically, but with the amount of money that's been pumped into the economy, it's kind of crazy. Wages have not risen. You know, there's a lot of issues that are that are happening. Christina, what do you look at when you're seeing some of this? Some when you're looking at your data, what different sites do you go to to kind of get compile your data and kind of come up with some? Um, I believe it or not, obviously the Wall Street Journal and other times every day. It's just a little bit fun house to look at it. Business Insider has a YouTube channel as well as you can read at it. Um, D Shores, Dr. Housing Bubble. Um, there is also, I, you know, I personally, I listen to Bloomberg, I listen to Fox. I like to hear multiple different points of view on what's going on. 
one of my favorite things to do is to turn on the Fox News channel when I'm driving home from a meeting because now they used to talk about the European markets from the European point of view. Um, I read, there used to be the Russell Report before Russell died, and then I read the Aiden Report. Um, both of them are kind of gold bugs. Uh, <laughs> I'm not a gold bug, but I actually like reading an, alter reading an alternative point of view because I don't. You don't want to drink my bath water for too long. <laughs> so it's that way. Um, and when anybody comes into town to speak, you know, whether it's the last person I listened to was an expert from Cornell that I went and listened to, um, I will, that's sort of economic based. I will also, um, real estate based, I look at cars, I look at NARS, National Association of Realtors, the California Association of Realtors. Um, I will look at, I personally love going to the Census Bureau and seeing their data. I really do. Um, I will do that as well. So I have a tendency to go into Google and type in what I'm interested in and read as many different points of view as I can from many different formats. When it comes to creating an economic report, I kind of have a hit list of the things that I look for. Consumer price index, consumer confidence, a producer price index, um, real wages, or housing formation. Um, I have a tendency to look for indicators versus specific places. Can you go over those one more time? I don't know if I can go through that. That's sure. exactly what I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> Consumer price index, producer price index. Uh, I didn't say this before, gross domestic product. Um, the uh, consumer confidence, housing formation, um, real wages. Unemployment, I look at the shadow statistics site as well as actually looking at the, the data that's available, it's published in general. I'll look at the Census Bureau, the government websites, um, I'll look at government reports. Um, if that's what comes up when I'm, reaching, when I'm researching that, I'd be happy to read those. So really I'm looking at a series of indicators when I do my research. And what I, what I like is I like charts. Right? <laughs> I like charts. Okay. I can speak for myself. We like sixty, and then you say, yeah, exactly. Okay, bring five. Right, exactly. Oh, no, 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 we can't. Um, I, I look for uh, so I want to see the charts. I, I, I want to hear opinions, but I want to see the charts. You know, one of my favorite is the S and P five hundred chart. One, my second favorite is is the um, GDP chart. Right, and the reason why is because you can see on um, if you pull the max chart, you can see that the gross domestic product used to range between like two to seven. And we haven't seen a seven gross domestic product in 10 years or longer. And so we've completely altered our economic movement on the gross domestic product level for since almost 2000. You look at the S&P 500 chart, it's the same thing. Like you understand why they used to say you earn 7% as long as you keep your, your uh, stocks long term. Look at it now. 20%, 25% variation in a single year. I mean, it used to kind of do this and now it does this. And you can see where the market itself, the nature of the investment market has changed in that asset class. So when I research, I'm looking for, I want, it's like saying, um, this is my version, I go, you know, this is pink. I was like, what does that tell me? It doesn't tell me anything. Unless I know it used to be red. And then I go, oh, it's moved. It's the movement that tells me something, not just the number. So I'm always looking to put the number, today's number, against its history. So I go to Y charts, that's the, which is a, a website you can get a lot of charts on. Um, trending, Y, chart. Just a letter Y, chart. Um, let's see, I'm on trending, business trending. I wrote it down. I'll look it up. I'll tell you before the end of the night. It's on my phone. Um, the Federal Reserve Board. The Federal Reserve Board. My favorite is Fred. Yeah, right. Fred. F R E D. It's the St. Louis Federal Reserve. And I love it because you can personalize the charts. Now, be very honest with you. Don't go to Fred and use a search engine. It sucks. Okay. <laughs> go to Google. Yeah. Type in the indicator that you're looking for. It will take you to the proper Fred chart, and then you can personalize that chart, and you can put it up against other indicators. So you can create a chart that actually compares Dow Jones to S&P 500, or compares new home prices to existing home prices. 
which to me is one of the indicators I look at when it comes to real estate. And you can do that market by market in that. And you can do it by market by market. So those, my primary websites are my chart websites. Those are the ones when I'm going to do an economic update, I read the data, but then I go to the charts. And I go, what do I think? What's the change I'm seeing? Yeah. So, okay, so the auto industry in the United States, so 
This is automobile. The chart is actually showing you inventories of automobiles. Okay. Um, so is the cash for clubbers down here, or right. all the way up here in That's the inventory? Right. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So we're building a lot of cars. It employs okay. five percent of the workforce. Of the so it employs five percent of the entire U.S. workforce. Contributes three percent to GDP. Where it's America's largest export is cars. Demand was pulled forward by the cash for clunkers, but we have record inventories, and the consumer is struggling to make the interest payments, and I'll get to how we know that in just a minute. So auto sales are falling year over year, and on an absolute basis, they, they've gone negative now. Used car sales are also falling, and one of the reasons why is that during, after the crash, we came up with some very creative new auto loan products and leasing products that extended. Like it used to be when you got a car loan, it was three to five years, right? Well, now we're doing seven-year car loans. So you think about what happens when, um, when these cars you know, come off, and a lot of these cars are coming off of lease now and coming off of these loans. And so, but the consumer doesn't really necessarily have enough money to go out and replace that car, or there's a huge loss. You know, like they're going to have to eat like this big twenty thousand dollar residual on the lease payment, right? So you have all of this challenge that's going on. And what what happens when that happens is, as you might expect, is that delinquencies go up. So now I'm going to skip and I'm going to go to six, seven, eight, nine. Excuse me. Um, I read somewhere that. Uber and Lyft represent something like 30 percent of new car sales. I don't have a number on that. That's interesting. Wow. And if that's the case, if you're finding a car to drive an Uber, you're probably not going to be able to keep that car. Probably not. So if if you go to um, skip one and go to this next slide, the next one after it, and we'll come back as the time doesn't allow. We'll look. There you go. Okay. So this is the forecast of the supply of used vehicles that's coming to market off of these leases. And um, subprime, and then Bloomberg, you know, is talking about subprime borrowers are, failing, are falling behind on their payments. And in fact, the delinquency rates, next slide, the delinquency rates on automobiles has, uh, loans, okay, has now reached the same levels it was during the crisis. Wow. So you've got a lot of delinquent auto loans and we're, we made more auto loans this time than we ever had in the past. We sold more cars too, right? And Wells Fargo just recently pulled back out of the out of the market. The other major players are Santander, which 80% of Santander's portfolio of auto loans is is subprime. So they're Spanish bank. They could be that could be trouble for them. So so the the the, re, the way that this might play out is that, okay, so you've got these delinquent auto loans. So what happens when an auto loan gets made? Okay, it's kind of the same, very analogous to house mortgage-backed securities okay, in 2006 and 8, right? So an, an auto loan gets made, it gets purchased by a bank, it's underwritten and purchased by a bank, it gets put into a pool, okay, and then that pool gets sold off into pieces and tranches and then there's derivatives that go around that and it gets multiplied out into the world, into the banking world you know, many, many different times. This is what happened with mortgage-backed securities, and nobody thought they could fail. So, um, in a, on a, in a mortgage-backed security, the way that we saved the banks, and there was maybe four trillion of that going on in the mortgage, that was the scale of the mortgages. There's two trillion in all the loans right now. So, only a part of that is subprime, but if you're at an 8% default rate, I mean, that's an incredible default rate, 8%. Um, so how are those mortgage, how are those auto-backed securities or ABSs being priced? Well, now if you go back a couple of slides, Merrill Lynch, yeah. So this is a chart of the, um, of the auto, uh, the price of auto-backed securities, okay? And the higher the price, the lower the yield, right? So if you think about it, it works like a mortgage. So the higher the price of the security, the lower the interest rate attached to that security or the rate that, that the investor is going to be returned. And in fact, as of the date of this chart, the auto-backed securities were bought at such a high price that the, the investors that were buying those backed securities were yielding 1%. And who's buying 
are those? European banks mostly? These are, these are for subprime also? For that, for that, yes, they're subprime in this pool. So if you're, if you're looking at an industry that is relying on financing to keep going, and we have this glut of inventory, the, um, right now, you know, the, the new car sales, the dealerships are sitting on a lot of inventory and the, the, pre, the um, incentives are going up. So it's $3,000 to $4,000 per vehicle now is the average incentive. And so the sector is, you know, this is 3% of our GDP. This is 5% of our workforce. So you think this could be a, one of the triggers? This could be a trigger. This could, this could be a trigger. So then what you do is if you then flash forward four slides. Sorry, they're out of order. No, it's no problem. But um, this is a map of where we make cars. Oop, nope, go back. That one. This is who gets affected. Okay? Oh, wow. So, and again, if you want to email me, I'll send you the slide deck. But, so if I'm an investor in real estate, I want to tie this back to real estate now, right? If I'm an investor in real estate, and I'm looking at a sub-market, okay, and I'm, and I'm, I'm thinking about buying a single-family home or an apartment building, where that map is flat. Going to Montana. So. <laughs> well, or Tennessee, or, you know, I mean... Uh, it's but, anywhere that's not but, here. Know, <laughs> I want to understand, as a real estate investor, I would, who is my client? Who is my tenant? Where do they work? What do they do for a living? What, you know, this is important in our economy going forward, right? This is really super important as investors. Right now, we are arguably towards a market top. So if you're when you're at a market top, if you're investing for cash flow, that's still great. Put a bigger down payment down, get a stable rate interest rate, right? Make sure that your rents and cash flow. Don't be going out speculating right now. It's not a really great time for speculation. And and um, but do your homework on who your tenant is. Make sure, make sure that when you buy something like that, you put a little more down so that you can counterbalance some of that downside. If you have a vacancy, if you have a, like or if you have to start giving a discount to fill your vacancy on your rent, or you have to give some incentives to get a tenant in. I mean, we remember the days when we had to offer incentives. You know, um, so these are some of the things that I think about. I think also think about, and this is not an auto-related thing, but I also think about when I'm thinking about tenants, do they work in a fast food restaurant? They might be laid off because have you been in a McDonald's lately that has a kiosk? Mm -hmm. And they're making a big move because all these states that are, think it's so sexy to go to $15 an hour, restaurants cannot operate at $15 an hour. It doesn't work. And I think that's a big challenge for us over the next 20, 30 years as well. In every single industry, we're going to have major issues. This is probably the, the biggest thing that we're seeing is so this is labor you know, being wiped out from technology. Right. So who's going to have a job in the new world and who's not? Right? I mean, going forward. So, so the auto industry, that's one. Okay. Okay. Do you want to do one? I don't really like this. <laughs> okay. I don't want to take the whole thing. <laughs> no, no. Here, here, there's, plenty, there's plenty of risks to go around right now. Oh, there's a lot of risks. Okay. And maybe you want to talk about pensions. And I have a slide for that, too. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, when is what we all was what we all want to know about. I'm personally not seeing this as a prime as, as a first first forerunner of a concern for me, but it's a very good one. And I'm I'm impressed with, with it. Um, I think it has to do with where your focus is. Like I, my focus is not on the car industry, so I didn't really say that at all. That's new to me. I'm a little more worried about the stock and bond market personally. That's what I'm worried about. Because I feel like it's overinflated. Um, I feel like it's writing on, you know, they say the Trump bump was over in May, if you were reading newspapers in May, but I don't see that it's over. I think it's writing on consumer confidence. I don't feel like it's writing at all on price and earning ratios, and it hasn't been writing on price and earning ratios since about 2000. So it's no longer. 
a market that's actually based upon asset price from my point of view. It's the quantitative easing, you can see it very quickly. There was a separation in, to me, between the health of the U.S. economy and the increase in the stock and bond market. Stocks in particular, in the equities market, call it that. And all of a sudden, the equities market was recovering, which is what was the purpose of quantitative easing, was to create recover. But it's creating recovers on the, for those people who own stock. Right? It's creating a market that is now moving separately from the economy. So the stock market with the equity market, from my point of view, was no longer a representation of the U.S. economic health. All you do is a gross domestic product versus the increase in the stock market. You go, those two don't line up. Yeah, you're not making the return that you should be. The asset prices aren't really collateral. But the gross domestic product, the underlying economic indicator behind the health of the, the quote-unquote market that the stock market is supposed to be representing is not increasing. We're barely staying above recession levels. So why was the stock market? stock market in particular going up and is now at an all-time high. Today. Again. Again. Today. So my concern is that my, my, if I were to bet on where I think it's going to go, I'd place a bet on that one as being a possibility. Not the, poss not the one, not the only one, but a strong possibility. I think it's moving in this, like if you thought before, right before, when we thought Clinton was going to come in office, right? And you saw the, the sort of slight flatlining of the market. It's not moving up as aggressively because we, as Clinton, is a Democrat. And she's, I'm not having a political conversation here. So, right? Please understand. I'm not having a political conversation here. I'm having a financial conversation here. So the financial markets, which was what is controlling the stock market because it's not the U.S. economy that's controlling the stock market. The financial markets was, was going, ah, I don't know about her. But when Trump gets in the office, and they're going, man, we're excited about what the economic changes are we believe he's going to do. So what's going to be the indicator, what's going to be the thing that pops the bubble, the stock market bubble? Is it going to be the loss of faith in Trump's, not capacity, um, his actual, the actual implementation of his plans? Is it going to be the loss of faith in that? And then the consumer, the financial market, is going to say, okay, we need to pull back now, we overestimate it. Is it going to be a pure numbers game? Look, we can't do this anymore. This is crazy. We can't Nothing keep really leveraging sense. out. Right? It's a bubble. And the enough murmur, I mean, I was told by my stock person back in November, Christina sell, because it's going to be a downtrend for 2018. We just want to have you sell before. So is there enough murmur going on that's just going to create spontaneously create a concern? I was looking at Jim Rogers. On the way over here, and Jim Rogers is like, yeah, we're going to have an economic downturn. We usually have one anywhere from four to eight years. Mm -hmm. We're at year nine. Right? So for me, I'm, that's my, that's my, if I'm going to throw some molson something out of the table to put your focus on, this would be another one. What are you guys focus here? How's that? <laughs> I said, you guys are being scared. What do you well, no, no, I, I, um, I, I personally, I'm going to be very honest with you. I don't think the timing for the downturn in the stock market is going to be in the next three or four months. I, my personal portfolio has done up 10% in the last six months. Right. right. Right? So it's been a very good vehicle. And I'm going to stay in that vehicle as long as that vehicle is moving. But what I'm trying to label it as is a speculation. And not a, not a what, you know, like a valuable asset. So you're paying very close attention because obviously I'm you know, paying you know, attention because it's probably not worth a 50% drop. It's it's or it's the same as buying um, uh, based on an LA. You're buying a, a <laughs> buy a condo in Santa Monica. Okay, you're not buying it for rent. Okay, you're buying for speculation. So I'm not saying that it's going to go down like that. I'm simply saying that if we're looking at economic downturn, which I don't think is this, is going to be in 2017. I don't think we're going to see the effect of that in 2017. That's not why I made the remark about being scared. It was, it was this, because the topic struck off. What do you think is happening with, I think, the real estate market? You're talking about triggering the spike. Yes. And you're noting the automobiles, and you're noting the stock well, market. So the let's reason talk why about the real estate market. Then. But the reason why I'm thinking is scary is if you think next year sometime you're pulling out of stock, and then if that market flattens, people are going to lose confidence. 
this can start the downside of real estate, then what's an investor to do? Where do you go? How do you protect that's longer down, that's further down this list. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll definitely be developing in cash. Well, that's well, a To sit in cash for a year, let everybody else sort it out, and then move out into the markets that are having trouble. Yeah, I remember saying two days. Right, same thing. Taking down the right. So, so I'm, you sit in cash for a year? Yeah, I've got no problem with that. But, the, but I don't think again, the economic market. I'm just describing the economic market. Now, did I talk about real estate? I haven't touched on real estate at all because real estate is again. I mean, I, I'm, I'm going to let her make her next point, but I really want to make the point about my opinion about real estate. If I can reserve that opportunity, I would love to. Let's definitely uh, talk about the other things outside of real estate first. Yes, because to me, he asked an economic question, not a real estate question. What do you guys think about Bruce is talking about student loan?
And so who is going to be the buyers of those? You know, so there are buyers out there. We're not going to 20% interest rates tomorrow. Don't freak out, okay? But affordability, one of the parts of the equation of affordability is how much you pay for your debt. And that will be going up in the short term. I, and I, I personally rather have very high interest rates and low asset values Me as well. Me too. You, you oh, make a yeah. lot more. Yeah. As soon as I'm saying I'm saying cash, I'm down for that one. <laughs> um, I have a slightly different point of view on that. Um, my point of view, because the other trigger that I would have said would have been the national debt, right? At 19 trillion, uh, 18.9, something or the other, 1.4% uh, of our gross domestic product. Uh, China's debt is over 300% of its domestic product, gross domestic product. Um, so, I was like, point of view, because what I noticed from what I noticed was that in the last downturn, when we looked like we were having a really hard time, because we were having a really hard time, you compare the charts for Europe, or Canada, or Japan, or not Japan, but China, Britain, Italy, they all were having a hard time. This was truly a national recession, not a national recession. So we personally, I'll give me from my point of my, we look like shit from my point of view. Um, I, I, I'm losing my ass, but in comparison, are they still buying our treasuries? Right? They were still saying, hey, the U.S. is still the single biggest economy. And even though we're going down, we're going down maybe a little slower than Italy was. And definitely slower than Greece was. Right. You still right? see that now, too. You still see a lot of... Exactly. Yes. My point is, is that whether we think the United States is going, building aggressively or not, or we're happy with the gross domestic product at 2% instead of 7%, the international market still thinks that we're a pretty good horse. And they're still buying our debt. And China still is, China stopped buying our debt, but they got on the same amount of debt that they own, of the US debt that they owned before. So, and, so I personally, like, my trigger would be the aggressive increase of interest rates. I don't think we're going to really want to do that as a country. And we have enough external demand that when we do roll our bonds over, which used to be we roll almost 70% of them every two years. I don't know if that's still true. I don't know if that's still true. I couldn't find the current number, right? So if somebody knows the current number, I'd love to hear it. But we used to roll over a lot of our debt in a very short amount of time. And we do still have buyers out there at these very low rates. So I, I don't worry about I gotta put this down. Here's my point of view. Here's what I think about it. We have an economy that's slowly increasing. Real wages are slowly increasing. Slowly. Housing formation is increasing. Right? Rents are increasing. Right? We're seeing uh, unemployment is actually starting to, it's, it's an all time low, but even marginal unemployment seems to be getting better. So things are increasing. Slowly. Gross domestic product, slowly, but we're getting better. Someone confidence is going up. We have a slow, very slow uptick in our economy. Right? And then we have the interest rate. And the question is, will the interest rate outpace our economic growth? That's what it does, and that's all the Fed's trying to do. All the Fed's trying to do is make sure that our interest rate doesn't outpace our growth. Now, right? That can create a lot of movement. We're already at real estate opinion. Days on market right now is the lowest you've seen in over it was 20 plus years. Might even be in the history. Days on market in real estate. How fast does a house sell or get an offer and actually go into escrow? That's days on market versus inventory. Right, months of inventory. We're, in my opinion, if Trump does get some of the financial markets to quote unquote loosen up, we actually could we could actually see the exponential upturn we're used to seeing in real estate. We could get another two years of exponential upturn in real estate. Because inventory is small, 
Prices are going up. I, I just just talking to a lady today who said there were 17 different people. Five of them were flippers looking at an open house that was that where a market had a house had come on the market the previous day, and there were 17 people there. I had a call on a condo that had deferred maintenance, and they said there were nine offers on the condo. So real world market, real world on the ground in Southern California is saying we have all the elements to go exponential. We have real wages going up. We have a slight increase in gross domestic product. Not great. We have housing formation increasing. To me, we have the indicators that we're moving into an exponential part of the cycle. I have enough momentum to have it be created. And there's still space. So Dodd Frank gets repealed. Dodd Frank gets repealed. I think we're going to go boom. What, what Congress is going to repeal Dodd Frank? It's going to the Senate now. Right. But it's so not, not done yet. Yeah. Yeah. So if that actually if that happens, so what's the reason why that would cause real estate prices? What, what, what gets taken away? It's, it's, as much as anything, it's the lending. Now, the markets are already listening. There's already, you know, about loans out there. There's already other, you know, banks are stepping in, hard money, private equity is stepping in in order to offer funding in that market. Yeah, and they've actually been doing that, by the way, for the last eight years. So. Well, it's just, it's more obvious to me. Um, so if we have an economic downturn, I'm not sure it's going to nail real estate yet. Does that make sense? Like, it might be one of the last sectors to actually hit. It might actually hit the S&P or the stocks first, and then we will maybe real estate, because real estate has so much pressure on them. What's your thoughts about the commercial sector, though? Because, yeah. you know, in the commercial sector, we see, you know, things selling in cap rates at three and four and two in some areas, and you just can't get a loan in that case. And you got to put 50, 60 percent down to make it, make the debt nature make sure. I heard that sell here. Can you think it's going to get into commercial lending? They've already been in commercial but, lending for a long time. Thank you. 
Excellent. It also, yeah. st it also stops a it, lot of the smaller lenders from doing some of the financing and things like that. It, as well. slowed, it has things. slowed the market down, and credit quality in the mortgage space is as high as it's ever been. And it's, it, the credit quality, especially on owner-occupied properties, is, is very high right now. Um, and Fannie Mae, maybe what you're thinking about, just expanded their debt-to-income allow, allowances, and they'll go to a 50% back end on an owner-occupied and 5% down now. And so that, you know, that is going to help some of those first-time home buyers to stretch and not have to take an FHA loan where they're stuck with the MI for the life of the loan. They just, they just changed the uh, reserve requirement for investment property too, right? Where, mm -hmm. what is it, five percent of loans outstanding if it's oh, over five or something like that? I don't know exactly. I don't have that. I have the chart at the top of my head. Office. There's a formula, you know, that they're doing. I'm easing myself out of lending, so <laughs> <laughs> much better at the uh, cap rate stuff right now. But, um, <laughs> but at any rate, that's my new question to you about multi and cap rates because I yes. So, so here's the thing, um, commercial side of real estate. And here's how I can kind of see things playing out. The Federal Reserve, I believe, wants to tighten one more time so that they have room to loosen when and if this recession comes, which every single president that has succeeded an eight-year term president, so President Trump qualifies this, 